All right, so you guys have probably seen this before, right? This is the ADDI model, and this is our overview of the instructional design process. Our very first step, right? We have to know who our learners are, what's the business challenge, and what's that ultimate performance goal, and is training even needed, right? Not all falls under that analysis, and that's all has to happen before we get to design development or even rolling a course out. Um, today, I'm going to live in the A of the ADDI model, and it's all going to be about analysis, data collection and really figuring out what is the root cause of the business challenge that uh, you know, you're essentially going to create training for or not, right? But you have to figure out what it is first. All right, and so, um, all right, so let's say we got our folders ready, we're ready to go. And so that first step is a discovery call. That's just kind of like your quick intake, right? Like, oh, they submitted a training request or maybe they haven't filled out any training requests. They just wanna tell you about their project and get you on the phone. Um, and so that can be like an in-depth thing or it could be something really quick that then moves into a kickoff meeting, right? So discovery calls, they can go a little bit different just kind of depending on whether somebody actually fills out a form and gives you information or they just wanna hop on the phone, uh, phone with you. Or if you're working um, an ID job in corporate, they might just walk over to your desk and tell you, oh, we got this training we need. And um, so that would be your discovery call. You may, may not get all the questions that you need answered during that call. Um, so you might have to wait for the kickoff meeting. So then after your discovery call, your you know, impromptu meeting, whatever that looks like, you're going to go do your own research. Then you have a full kickoff meeting with your actual project team, everybody that's going to be a part of the project. Um, and then you go through interviews and then assessing and observing. And so I'm going to get into all of these different little pieces of your analysis process. So if you've never done performed a needs analysis before, then you're probably wondering where to start. And I really like to tell everybody to start thinking like a journalist, right? And the reason why is because when you think like a journalist, you will zero in on exactly the right questions to ask to identify the content area, the primary goal, and the learner population. So the journalists, they, they famously use those five whys, right? The who, the what, the where, the when, and the why. And so when they are satisfied, you know, they've gotten all the answers to these five W questions, right? Well, then they can, then they're ready to write their story. Well, for us, it's no different, except for the questions that you ask are going to get a little more specific. And the way that I like to categorize them for you is analysis question buckets, right? You want to find out who are your learners? What's that business challenge that they're trying to solve? What do the learners need to be able to do? What's that performance goal? And what are the constraints? If you can get all the answers for these four buckets, then you're doing a good job, right? That's how you know um, that you are making progress. And, the, and getting answers to these four buckets of questions will give you a solid structure to hang the rest of your course content, right? Or even to just uh, decide which direction you're gonna go in. All these things will reveal themselves, just like the story emerges as the journalist asks those questions, the same kind of thing happens when you're designing a course, right? It's gotta start with analysis and we gotta figure out these four categories of questions. Now, the things that I see as far as pitfalls when people are doing analysis is three things. One, they overcomplicate it, right? So instead of, for instance, um, you know, doing, uh, you know, just contacting five learners, they try to contact 100, right? It's just overcomplicating what needs to actually happen. And so uh, really thinking about keeping your sample data small, right? If you are going to roll out global training to 500 learners, you don't need to interview all 500 of them, right? Let's get five of them, right? That represent each, you know, type of learner persona that might be taking your course. Uh, dismissing existing data. A lot of people will think, okay, I got to do a full analysis. I got to go like, like get my own data and, and I got to create these new surveys and I've got to, uh, you know, analyze uh, the data that I've created from all these surveys that I've sent out and, oh, I'm missing a piece of data. And instead, what it does is you actually dismiss the existing organizational data that is already available to you. And that's actually what you should be reviewing first is what is the data that they already have that can answer those key questions to figure out that key root problem, right? What is the root of the problem uh, that they're presenting to you? And then also 
The other thing is uh, people are, will do an analysis and they think this is the end all be all. Um, once I've discovered this problem, that's it. That's the problem and it's never gonna change. Um, and are unaware of the shifting needs, especially in corporate. It's a, you know, in many ways it's fast paced and the problems and the challenges are shifting and changing. And even you might even find out through your analysis uh, that it wasn't exactly what you thought it was going to be when you started like analyzing the data. And so the needs can actually shift and the problem can actually shift. And you might actually discover that the real root problem is different from what the, you know, the, uh, the supervisors think that brought the training request to you. And so these are the three main pitfalls um, that I see uh, from, from those that are new to needs analysis, right? And so just back to our four buckets, I'm gonna um, share with you some critical questions to ask within each category. And um, I actually have a document for you, of course. And so in this document here, I have 20 analysis questions that you guys will be able to think and then you'll be able to make a, a copy of it, uh, but I wanna cover them for you now. So when you open this up, you'll see here's 20 questions and you can fill them all out. So you don't have to memorize everything that I'm about to show you, okay? So I wanna know what are some of the questions that you'd ask about the learners. So before I share my questions, what are some of the questions that you guys would think, okay, I need to know this about the learners during analysis. What are some of those questions that you would ask? Age, experience, what previous knowledge do you have? What's your education level? What do they already know? What are your frustrations? Good one, Sarah. Demographics, role, experience, interests, what are they not doing? Excellent. What tools do they use? Uh, technology, accessibility needs. Excellent, excellent. And what is working well? So those, you guys are right on the right track. So I have the same kinds of questions. Who are the learners? What are their roles? What's their environment? I could also um, talk about what's their environment, what kind of tech do they have access to, but also what's their environment? Are they working on a job site? Right? Are they in construction? Are they in a warehouse? Or what? Where are they? Who are these people? Um, what is their experience with this topic? Are they newbies to this topic? You guys ask that same kind of question. What's their familiarity? Uh, which employees are impacted by the problem or the change? And then which departments are affected by this problem or change? And so these are the types of questions uh, that you want to answer about your learners. All right. What are some of the questions you'd ask about the business challenges? So you guys, you guys know more than you give yourself credit for. You see all, how aligned you were with those questions you asked? Same kind of things. When you think about it in buckets, it becomes really easy to know what kind of questions you're going to ask. Okay, we've already asked a bunch of learner questions. Now, what about business challenge questions? All right, what's the problem you're trying to solve? What outcome are you looking for? Emily, your question about time frame and budget would fall under the constraints. Uh, let's see, what is the issue they want to solve with the training? How will the training improve employee performance? Which tools need to be utilized more than they currently are? Uh, what's the business objective? What resources do they have? Scope and sequence of what they want to achieve? So the, yeah, so the constraints, yeah, that's, these are good questions. We would, uh, Malia? Malaya, but uh, you'll want to put those fall in the constraints bucket. Let's see, goals, outcomes, yep. What departments are having troubles? How is the problem impacting the business? Yes, yes. Why is it important for this to be solved? Yes, I like that question. How many people are involved? And uh, why do you need it? Great, you guys are thinking like journalists. So I got some of the same questions. What is the problem or challenge, right? You guys had that too? Uh, do they have a solution in mind already? What are the existing or immediate issues and or behaviors that need to be addressed, right? Uh, what are the risks and challenges of this problem? And then what is the root cause? They may not know this, but that's part of what you're gonna discover. All right, what about the performance goals? 
right? What do you need them to be able to do by the end of this training? What are some of the questions you'll ask to get to the heart of those performance goals? What does success look like? It's our favorite question, isn't it? Yes, I'm so glad to see like three people ask that question. All right, what's the objective? What, what are they not doing and why? That's a good one. What changes do you wanna see? Yes, how will you measure success? Excellent, excellent. Uh, when do you wanna have it solved by? I usually put that in constraints, but it's still a good question. Uh, how we measure KPIs, key performance indicators is what that stands for. Learners will need to be able to do, make sure to put that do word in there, um, how to measure them, what do you want in the end? All right, what's not happening that should be? Awesome. All right, so you guys got most of the questions I have. What does success look like? What will happen if we do nothing? What will you to measure the impact? You guys got that one. And then what materials do you already have? I think that may be the only question I came up with that you guys do not have, did not have on your list. And so you guys know, you guys got it. Performance goals right there. You guys knew what those questions are. And like I said, the only one I would add is what materials do you already have? All right, what about the constraints? Now, some of those constraint questions ended up in these other um, categories. So you can go ahead and put them back on here, right? Time. Budget, what other constraints do we need to consider? How much time are you allotting? Technology, tools, when do you plan to roll this out? Deadlines, budget, SME time, that's a good one, Natalie, SME time. Resources, yeah, do they already have any resources we can use? Yeah, budget, cost. How many employees can we train at one time? Budget, time, previous knowledge. Learner's motivation. That might be tricky to, um, to ask during your, your um, your discovery call and your kickoff meeting, but it is certainly something that you could um, ask of your learners themselves. Let's see, stakeholders. Okay, so who are the stakeholders? All right, so I've got technical requirements and limitations. So that might be, we don't have a learning management system. Our people are in the field, they can't do it on a computer. It needs to be mobile friendly, right? Those are the type of technical requirements and limitations. Uh, what is already available for implementation? What have you already done? Budget, timeline, is there a certain level of standards that we're looking for? A certain level of quality? Have you done something before that worked in the past? Those kinds of things, right? So these all fall under constraints. All right, good. See, so you guys had an instinct for this as well. All right, so let's say that um, you're on a discovery call. So it's your first call, it's your first meeting. And so if you are on a Zoom, I encourage you to record the call if it's like kind of a formal discovery call. But like I said, sometimes a discovery call might just be somebody walks up to your desk and says, oh, I have a training need. That's, and that might be the extent of your discovery call. And so you can ask questions then. Uh, but like I said, if it doesn't happen in the discovery call, you can always do it in the kickoff meeting. So it just kind of depends on what that process looks like in your company. But since um, a lot of you guys might just be working with volunteer clients, um, that discovery call might be the first call that you have um, to introduce yourself and ask them about any projects that they might want you to work on as their volunteer instructional designer, right? And so in that case, you might get a full discovery call and you'll want to record the call. You want to bring your questions. So that um, 20 questions template that um, I am sharing with you guys and it's also in the academy. You can use that and just run through the questions. Um, you can come up with your own questions based on those four buckets uh, that I shared with you. Uh, you want to make sure to write down all the answers. You can't write them all down in the moment. That's why you'd want to record your call um, so that you can get those answers in the recording. And you can also throw your recording into a transcription service like otter.ai is a free one. And there's a couple other ones that you can do for free. 
Um, that way it'll just give you uh, the answers without having you having to just transcribe yourself. Um, and then you could also at this, during the discovery call, request any materials. Do you already have any content? Uh, do you have any PowerPoints? Do you have any training manuals? Do you have anything, any resources about the topic uh, that you are willing to share with me at this point? Um, you also want to find out any kind of contacts that you can have. Can I um, have the contact information for the subject matter expert? Um, who are the subject matter, ex uh, the stakeholders that are going to be uh, reviewing all the milestones on this project? Can I have their information? Um, do you ha have data that I can get access to? Um, do you have, can I survey the learners? Right, these kinds of things. What kind of things can you get access to uh, so that you can perform your analysis? And then of course, the real thing that you also wanna discover during your discovery call is, is training even needed? And so um, if you guys wanna throw in the chat, what are the three times, what are the three things that you need uh, to, to have in order for training to be required, right? Training only solves three problems. What are they? Do you guys know? Knowledge, skills, and sometimes attitude. Yes, thank you, Holly. Yep, so knowledge, skills, or sometimes attitude gaps. Those are the only problems that training can actually solve. And so if you guys have ever seen um, Kathy Moore's, I wanna point it out because I think it's worth showing. Kathy Moore's, did I put it in here? No, nah, sure. I'll pull it up and then I'll add it there. Kathy Moore. Here we go. Do, do, do. All right, so you'll see here, why aren't people doing this one thing? Is it caused by a problem with environment, knowledge, skills, motivation? And then you can follow the yeses or the noes, right? You can see skills, Skills go straight there. Knowledge, where should knowledge be short, stored? Job aid, great, create a job aid. Memory, create a course, right? Create training. If it's a job aid, make the job aid. Is it, is, do they need to know how to use a job aid? No, self-explanatory. Just give them the job aid, see? So skills, motivation, is it due to um, environment, lack of knowledge or low skills? Nope, would realistic, Simulations motivate them? Mm, yes, okay, training. No, find another way to motivate them. Training's not the answer. And the rest of it is basically training is not the answer. So if you have any questions about that, that is a, a great little resource right there. I'm printing it now. Yes, it is very handy until you actually memorize it. I'm sure you guys will memorize it at, at one point. All right, so... When you're in that discovery call, or if you have to wait to the kickoff, what you're looking for is you're looking for root causes. And root causes for business challenges fall in a couple of different buckets. And these are the main root causes for any kind of performance gap. The one, the first one might be expectations. So what are the work requirements, procedures, and is there a clear understanding of what is expected of that employee? So many times the problem or the challenge that that business is experiencing is because they have not set clear expectations with their employees. So that could be a pretty easy uh, problem to solve. And that could be really the truly the root cause. Uh, the other one is what about their feedback on those expectations? Do, do the employees know how they are doing? So if they have clear expectations, are they given clear feedback for those expectations. And of course they have to have clear expectations in order to get feedback. Are they getting feedback on the expectations of what they're supposed to be doing? What about measurement? Do you know if they are doing well, right? How do you know if they are doing well? And how are you measuring performance? So if there's, if there's no measurement in place, well then you're not able to give them feedback, right? on your, their expectations. So this could be a root cause of a performance issue. The other one is, are consequences aligned with expected performance? Are there positive, 
and negative consequences. So if they are supposed to, I don't know, file the TPS reports, are there consequences if they do or don't file their TPS reports, right? So there could be a performance gap just because there are no consequences, right? And that could be the root problem. What about the tools and the systems, right? So you're noticing probably that these root causes have nothing to do with training. These are not training problems. They are just root causes at this point. So it could be uh, the tools and the systems. So is it uh, a software? Is it uh, the system that they use to, or the process that they use to access this software? Is it just like convoluted and doesn't work? Um, is it broken? Are the tools broken? Do they have all the tools that they need? This could be a root cause for the performance problem that doesn't need training. What about just uncapable people? What I mean by that, this is more about um, the, the, the people that they selected to do the job. Did they do a poor job of hiring people who um, to do this job? And that just might be that they hired people who are incapable of doing the job. Well, can those people um, be trained? Maybe, but not if they are um, so severely lacking in the knowledge, skills, and abilities uh, that they needed that it was more about they selected the wrong hires for that role and not necessarily a training problem. And then the other thing is if it's a root cause of KSAs, knowledge, skills, or abilities, then that is a root problem that we can address and that we can solve. But we are also in the unique position that we are usually the, uh, one of the first uh, people that find out about a business challenge that's happening uh, where we actually go and find out what is the root cause and it may not be training at all. And I'm gonna give you an example and we will give solutions that are both training solutions and non-training solutions, right? Especially um, if it's a root cause that includes a couple of different things. Maybe it's expectations are not lined out, are not clear, and there's a knowledge gap and a skills gap, right? So if they don't have clear expectations and there's a skill gap, well, there might be a non-training solution, which is to make the expectations clear, right? And measurable and all those other kinds of things. And then also to create training for the skills to meet those expectations, you see? And so we would share both of these solutions both training and non-training. And so um, that's one of the unique things about our job is that we try to solve problems, even problems that are not necessarily training related. All right, so we've had our discovery call. We've gotten as much material as we can. We've gotten as many answers to those 20 questions as we have. Um, and we've tried to answer all the different buckets of questions. Now, we're also going to do our own research, and this is very important, right? You have to go do your own research. You got to go do your own research on the topic, uh, read those existing materials, maybe reach out to some of the supervisors um, and just kind of do some informal uh, conversations with them. And you want to keep track of all the research that you do, right? Let me throw it in your folders, right? Whether you are, you know, keeping track in a Google Doc or whatever, you just want to have an organized way so that you can refer to all the research that you do during your analysis phase. You also wanna do um, prepare uh, for your kickoff calls, right? So you can get all your questions answered, get everybody on the same page, right? And make sure that you have all the answers that you need for your analysis phase uh, in that kickoff call. So you'll want to prepare for your kickoff meeting and you'll prepare by um, listing your questions, right? So you will probably have those 20 questions, but really you're, it's the same kind of thing. So you're going to find out the why, what are the challenges and the expectations of this project? How, you know, what's the visual approach that they are interested in using? Um, is there any um, technology that they prefer to use? Um, are there any kind of constraints? Um, how are we going to measure success? Who, who are the members of my team? Who's on this project? Um, what are the stake, who are the stakeholders that are gonna review this project and give sign-offs? Um, can you give me an overview of your company or your department, right? There are many times where you're gonna be uh, presented a training 
challenge or a business challenge, and it might be for a department that you have no clue about. And so it's worthwhile in your kickoff meeting saying like, can you explain to me about how you like a little overview of your department and how it works? And then you also want to find out the what, what's the learning outcomes, the topics, the content, what kind of resources are available, and then the when, developed by when, what is my availability of the subject matter experts, so when can they meet, how do they like to uh, communicate, and those types of things. And then you're also uh, going to give a little, a timeline, kind of a, a rough one, right, based on what they have, what they, what you discuss in your kickoff meeting. And then also maybe a, a proposal. But really, your main goal for that kickoff meeting is to come up with your performance goal, right? What is your, your clear, measurable performance goal of what does success look like? What do those learners need to be able to do by the end of your training? And of course, you want to answer those other questions. And so that's really what your kickoff meeting is all about, is getting everybody on the project team um, on the same page. All right, so you've had your kickoff call, you've had your discovery call, you've done your research, you've had your kickoff call. Now you're gonna go do your interviews. You're gonna to talk to your learners, you're gonna interview your subject matter experts, you're gonna to talk to those top performers. Who are the people that are doing it the best? You're gonna find out from them what it is that makes them so great. So if you're doing a sales training, you go talk to the top performing salesperson because you wanna know what it is that their day looks like. How do they follow up with leads? How do they pitch their services and all those other kinds of things? Because that will be some gold to add to your um, problem-centered uh, course design. Also the supervisors of the employees, right? What do they see is the challenge and what is it that their employees are not doing? What's the performance uh, gap and so on and so forth. And you want to capture everything through all your interviews. And you can also, um, uh, you know, you can just do like five people that you interview for your learners, right? You just, you're creating your uh, learner personas. You're really just kind of getting a feel for who these learners are, what keeps them up at night? What do they struggle with? What do they, what would, um, you know, what would they like to see change um, after this training and those kinds of things. And we have learner persona templates and guides and all that kind of stuff. And again, I have that for you right here. Learner persona templates, you can find it in the academy, learner persona interview guide and that kind of thing. So you'll be able to find that there. All right. All right, and the last thing that I have for you as far as your last step for your analysis part of um, the Addy model and basically getting ready to um, make some design decisions is some assessing and observing. So what does this look like? This could be maybe you get to shadow learners on the job, right? Maybe uh, you can, you know, beyond just interviewing them about like who they are, but like what is it that they actually have to do so you can shadow them on the job to maybe see what it is that they need to do. That gets a little tricky now, right? Um, as far as shadowing learners go, but maybe it is an opportunity for you. Uh, there's also some assessment data. Have they done any uh you know, topics that are related to your topic before? And did they have to take some kind of assessment as part of that training that they've taken? Can you review that assessment data? Can you see how they did on those tests? Can you see what their scores were? Uh, can you uh, send out some surveys, right, to kind of, you know, get a measurement on their current, um, you know, level of knowledge on, on that topic that, you're, that you might be creating training for? Um, is there any business data that is available. And it all depends on what your business challenge is as far as what kind of data that you would wanna look for. And so I'm gonna give you a full example about the type of data that you might wanna look for to solve a specific type of problem, just so you can think about the type of data that you might want to collect depending on your business challenge. Okay, so here's my example. All right, let's say that they come to you and they say, well, there's currently a 30% turnover rate among employees in the Midwest, Midwest region who have been with the company for 90 days or less, right? So that means new employee, they've been there for less than 90 days and they're either quitting or they're getting fired, right? And so 
they're like, well, we want to reduce this from 30% to 15%. Because um, as many of you guys know, turnover rates in a company leads to a large amount of cost and time wasted, right? Because they say something like an average of like $30,000 for every new person that you want to hire. And so if you're, if it takes 30,000 to hire somebody new and they're leaving in less than 90 days, well, then you've lost your investment in onboarding and hiring and going through that process with that person. And you have to do it all over again. And so you can imagine how, just how high, you know, an exponential that can get when you're trying to run a business, if people, if your employees keep leaving. And so this is the problem that they bring to you. And they're like, all right, so this is probably a training problem. So, you know, we need to reduce the, the um, new hire turnover. We have not decided at this point that this is a training problem, right? Because we have to do our analysis. We have to find out if this really is a knowledge, skills, or an attitude gap. So what kind of data will you need to look at and gather for this example? What, just off the top of your head, what do you think is some of that data that you'd ask of the company to look at or data that you'd create yourself? Okay, manager skills, their interview skills, maybe. Find out the exit interviews. Yeah, why are they leaving? Do these new employees get coaching or mentor after they finish training? Exit surveys, yup. Exit interviews, who's doing the hiring? Are the job descriptions accurate? Yeah. Um, what training is currently available? We're, yeah, so maybe that, but we want to look, um, just so you guys know, right, we want to look at the actual data to see if this is even a training problem, right? We don't even know if it's a, if it's a training problem. Uh, desired skills times, uh, I guess you mean like versus hired skills and skills, what kind of support do they have? Which departments are affected? Yes, yes. Is it department specific or company wide and the interview process? So good. You guys have already got some really good ideas about the type of data that you want to look at. And so let me um, share with you some of the data collection that might happen. So let's say that we go to the HR system and we would look at exactly what you guys said. Like what are the exit interviews? What are those? What are the reasons for turnover? And that's why I put turnover codes. Um, what about the turnover rates by supervisor that does the hiring? Are there any performance observations, right? Like when you're doing your, your shadowing or your interviews of the supervisors or things like that, uh, doing some interviews with the supervisors or the subject matter experts, right? Find out from them what they think uh, is the reason for the high turnover. Uh, maybe survey the supervisors that are affected. And then also reviewing any kind of materials that they already have, uh, like the training materials that you guys mentioned. And then, oops, I got a typo one here. Do some supervisors. Okay, so, and the next thing that you wanna have before you ever get into pulling some of the real data and analyzing data is you gotta come up with some hypothesis questions, right? Otherwise, you don't know, you don't know how to narrow down what you're looking for in the data. So three questions that, we, that I might ask in this situation is, are poor hiring decisions to blame? for high turnovers among new employees? Do some supervisors have higher turnover rates for new employees, right? So are some of the supervisors just hiring the bad apples, you know, like more often than others? Um, and then what do supervisors, oh, I got two, oh, two typos, sorry guys. What do supervisors need to make better hiring decisions, right? What do they need to do to make better hiring decisions? So if I know that these are my questions, then I am now targeted as far as what data I'm going to look for and what I'm going to look at. All right. So let's say I looked at the hiring decisions and I wanted to determine whether or not poor hiring decisions were leading were the leading cause of high turnover. So the first step is to identify reasons employees left the company within their first 90 days. So this first, this um, top three reasons 
accounts for 85% of the turnover. They just resigned, they quit, they were terminated, or they were terminated uh, due to poor performance, right? So those are the top three reasons that we have uh, for turnover. So that doesn't tell us much, right? And then if I look at turnover rate by supervisor, I can see that it's nothing, nothing, none of them really um, stand out, right? So if I, the turnover rate for new employees is 30% and a new employee is defined as somebody who is within the first 90 days of employment. And then you can see here, um, I did it by turnover rate based on how many years of experience that supervisor had when they hired them. And so you can see that even um, the supervisors with more years of experience, like you know, 10 years of experience, still had just as high of a turnover rate, you know, 40% here, than those who had little experience. So that's what this is showing here. So we can see that there's not necessarily a direct correlation between years of experience hiring and the turnover rate. So that can't be our problem. All right, so then let's say based on those performance observations, the interviews that you do, that's why it's so important to actually go not just look at data like only, but also to go do the performance observations, the shadowing, the interviews, uh, maybe the survey. And then based on that, you might find that there are three other things that came up and then there's more data to look at. So those things might be, uh, they, spend too, they spend too little time uh, interviewing, right? And so then we can go look at some data. What's the average interview time? Okay, less than 30, 15 minutes. Well, if it was less than 15 minutes interview time, there's an average turnover rate of 37%. If it's 15 to 30 minutes, you can see the average turnover rate is only 29%. And then if they had 30 minutes or more, the average turnover rate is 23%. So now we might be onto something, right? That maybe it has something to do with a little bit of that time spent interviewing. What about the interview location? So supervisors who conduct interviews in inappropriate places might have higher turnover rates. And we see that the break room um, and another place, right, or a desk might have higher turnover rates than those that were doing a formal interview in a conference room. So that might be another key piece of information that we have. What about prepared questions, right? So some supervisors are using prepared questions, some were not. And then those who did not use prepared questions have an average turnover rate of 33%. And those who do use them have an average turnover rate of 27%. So we can determine, and I usually, and you make a little table, right? So if we think that the root cause is supervisors don't spend enough time interviewing, inappropriate locations and not using prepared questions, we can give a why, and then we can think about some solutions. So supervisors don't spend enough time interviewing. Well, we wanna educate supervisors on time they save by making better hiring decisions. This doesn't necessarily mean that it's training, but if we do end up going with training, it's something you can include in there. We have another root cause, inappropriate locations. Well, they need to create a procedure for supervisors to coordinate their schedules so they can book a conference room. What about not using prepared questions? Well, new interviewing procedures will address this issue and make sure that everybody has uh, the prepared questions that they need for their interviews. You see how just based on the analysis and looking at data and looking at interviews that we're able to determine root causes and we're already um, able to start thinking about some of our solutions. All right. So let's say that um, now we have gone through our example, some of the recommendations just based on some of this analysis, right? This is not us designing a program, but we're going to come up with some recommendations before you get into the design and you're going to present it to those stakeholders, right? So the first thing that you want is you want your performance goal, right? So we're going to build training and the performance goal is going to be supervisors will demonstrate the ability to make good hiring decisions by selecting the best candidate in at least three out of four case scenarios introduced in the interviewing skills training program, right? And then some supporting goals. 
Now, supporting goals are things that the organization will need to do in order to support the training and solve the root problem. Locate items on the company internet, where the, where the interview prep checklist is, where's the interview question list, and the interview procedure document, right? That all needs to be on the company internet. Um, identify um, the, inter the ideal, I'm missing a letter there, identify the ideal interview duration, right? How long is an ideal interview, right? According to the data, and then describe ideal setting for interviews. Is it the conference room? Just find out what, what it is. And so those are some supporting goals. Then we have non-training recommendations based on this example. They might be things like, uh, before the training goes live, we're gonna need a training announcement from the executives. And we're also gonna want our, our um, stakeholders and our executives or supervisors or whatever to share project goals and new expectations for those interviews. And then we also want to adjust the interview scheduling on the way they currently have it. Let's say for instance, um, they aren't able to, um, you know, reserve the conference rooms and that's why they're meeting in break rooms, et cetera, uh, because of the conflicts in scheduling. And so recruiter schedules interviews back to back, advanced notice from the recruiter of a scheduled interview and supervisors book a conference room as soon as an interview is scheduled. So these are just examples of what you would give as far as rec recommendations based on your analysis that are non-training and training related. And then you could also even come up with a couple of options, right? These are just two that I came up with. Though obviously there are other solutions to this problem, but it could be option A, a two hour on-site training and the trainer would travel to each location to deliver the training class. 14 total classes are needed. It'd be 10 grand and everybody would be fully trained hands-on instruction in small groups. Or we could send people out pre-work and do a one hour webinar and they have to complete two pre-training assignments, zero dollars in training costs, and a two-day deployment time, right? And so clearly you might want to have, they would probably pick option B. It doesn't cost that much. Uh, it would obviously scale faster and, um, and it would be done faster. So you can see how we've come to a, a conclusion or a solution at the end of our analysis based on the actual analysis that we did and the data that we looked at and the data that we collected and all those different pieces of the analysis that we went through allows us to have a conclusion and a solution that is firmly and deeply rooted in analysis. And that is what you want every single time that you come to a conclusion, you should have done all your analysis in order to come to your conclusion.